thank you, Monica. There somewhere. There's a lot of people in this audience, which is really nice. Um, but thank you, Monica. Thank you also to Denise, who was really remarkable in her organization. Um, there's a job for you in Houston if you want better weather, Denise. Um, so we're back to the future. Um, the, the future today, however, is, is laden with a nostalgic tinge. Everyone adores these images. Who wouldn't want to be sitting in the House Rooker bubble right now? But they've led to some real confusion, I would say, for the discipline. We need to distinguish what it means to roam around an exciting projection of the future in the past tense versus the construction of a future today in the present tense. In other words, this nostalgia for the radical moment of the 60s has generated a collection of past hopes rather than the production of new ones. So oddly, this proliferation of examples seems to have frozen the discipline somewhat. Rather than advance decisions or make propositions, we tend to just pull out additional examples and sort of constantly accumulate these examples um, in a, a manner of sort of um, Ed Ruscha's I Think I'll um, painting from 1983. And I don't know whether we should be a little bit concerned that the Obamas chose this painting as one of their many for their collection for the White House um, I was hoping for a little more decisiveness on their part. So um, today for my talk, I want to call it sum. Um, I want to add it all up rather than just add it all. Um, given that I'm about to start a new job, I'm particularly interested right now in methods, methodology, and what matters, especially for architectural education. So I'm going to be a little bit more specific maybe in terms of my understanding of design today. So my interest is in a very immediate future, essentially the now. In the spirit of our discipline, specifically architecture, I'd like to offer five methodological points. That seems to be a historically um, tried and true uh, method. So by some, I mean aggregation as opposed to alternatives. That is, I'm keen on pointing in specific directions rather than accumulating examples. So the, the first of my five points will be Point itself. It's a new book series that I've started, which is called, in fact, Point. Um, each Point book is one sustained essay. As a method, Point sits between the pithy polemic, and here you see Le Corbusier's um, pithy polemic, that one of the best pithy polemicists, um, which plays a role in our discipline, an important role in our discipline, but sometimes do never catalyzes beyond the soundbite. Um, and it, so it sits between the, the, the polemic and it sits also bet between the comprehensive encyclopedia, which similarly plays a significant role. SMLXL certainly had its moment, but it's now been mimicked to the point of literal physical exhaustion. Um, so each single author for point is asked to write a single sustained essay on one point of contemporary relevance with the hope that these points will then catalyze contemporary discourse in a, in a more specific way. Um, the first three point volumes are um, being written by Sylvia Lavin, Peter Eisenman, and David Joslett. Sylvia's should be out next, um, next year, next spring. A second point would be to look at the question of research in architecture, which seems to have subscribed to a mandate of ever-increasing expansion. We no longer know what to do with an, in an infinitely expanded field within our discipline, however. Research has been understood to mean exhaustive proliferation. Again, the accumulation of examples, but the exhaust, that exhaustive proliferation has become an end in itself. Like Google search engines, researchers are understood to collect information without bias, without direction, without aim. And this proliferation of material tends to offer no traction. Um, and I would actually say that, that um, one of my hesitations about joining this event is I, I actually have a bias against the Pecha Kucha model, um, the sort of idea of simply accumulating material within one, one area will generate something new without curation. Um, and so that's, that's sort of one uh, small criticism I would, I would point to. Uh, so a third point would be the question of interdisciplinarity, which is actually a a parallel point or a point that's tied to the point of research. We've tried to allow architecture to incorporate broader terrain, but the fallout has actually become a strange version of a wannabe expertise that has to do with every domain we incorporate except for architecture. 
We lose the generalist expertise, and I would, I would um, second Nicola in, in referring to our generalist expertise. We lose that generalist expertise that we're really good at and believe that we have to become experts in everything else, although we never can, in other areas like science, psychology, philosophy. To wit, a housing studio, which you can find um, referenced on Archonnect, where the research is on the, it's a housing studio, let me underscore, it's the research was done was on the production of omega-3 fatty acids. Um, so the, the research here is the collection of information on uh, uh, omega-3 fatty acids and, and somehow then there's this transformation that that turns into housing. So architecture is a generalist expertise. Um, uh, rather than bemoan some perceived lack of intellectual depth, or rather than lose that very particular expertise, we have to revel in it. Rather than waste our time trying to accumulate knowledge in other disciplines um, in an exhaustive manner, we have to plumb the possibilities that architecture itself offers those fields in its intersections with them. With them. So here there's a, just a diagram of architecture intersecting with, say, economics, politics, technology, but one has to approach these fields always from the fact that you're approaching them from architecture, not from those fields themselves. Um, I'm also sort of, uh, I have to say, um, rather baffled at the lack of interest or lack of research or lack of depth with our own, the, the history and material within our own um, discipline. It, it's as if that's, that doesn't carry enough weight for, for projects and so the, the projects always have to turn to something else. So if you go back within our own discipline and within our own discipline's history and you look at some previous models, you'll find some clear methodological legibility. The Bauhaus bullseye provides a legible framework, and this is the, the curriculum from 1925 and then the revised curriculum from 1937 on the right, it provides a, a legible framework for the variety of production that was housed within the Bauhaus. Similarly, Mises' matrix of IIT's curriculum defined a very specific framework for that school. Both of these frameworks were additionally sustained by the two schools' buildings, especially the universal space of, of Mises' Crown Hall. So there was a sort of uh, uh, coincidence of the uh, pedagogical methodology and the, the space within um, the studies itself. But curricular representation and legibility don't have to lie just in a chart or a building, they can be found in problems themselves within, a, within um, architectural education. So for example, the nine square grid problem of the Texas Rangers in the 1950s has its own legibility and set up its own parameters which um, defined an area of, of, um, uh, of education and of, of research, let's say. Today, if you try to find a curricular logic, you'll, you, you'll tend to find in almost any school that the curriculum is defined really only in the manner of the distribution points of the NAAB. Um, proliferation has replaced directive. The categories of distribution are seen as ends in themselves. So architecture's generalist expertise has to be established as a biased attitude already, I would say, within the first year so that it can mature by a student's end of, of studies or thesis. Studios and seminars in between have to instill techniques that foster modes of synthesis rather than mere proliferation and that equip students to judge whether what they're doing is worthwhile. And this, I would say I echo um, Gary's concern with the sort of um, absence of any means of judging um, whether a design is any good. So rather than uh, uh, proclaim ourselves to be just facilitators, I would say that we have to also um, uh, catalyze, but also curate and direct. Which brings us to point four, which is design. Without fostering a synthesis, design, like research, turns into a proliferation of examples with no qualification, no means of judging what's good or what's worth pursuing. And these are just shots from various ends of uh, year uh, exhibitions at different schools and this, this sort of collection of, of matter. I would argue that some of the most successful schools have been willing to curate that proliferation uh, under the terms of a form of legibility, offering, like the Bauhaus and IIT, a visual idiom or a legibility 
um, to their design. So you have, and these are just some examples. Um, there are more, but uh, um, Stanley Tigerman at UIC, which, which uh, was formed essentially as a critique of modernism. Um, Bernard Chumi at Columbia, where the this, this school fostered a, a research into the specifics of how computation and transformations in geometry could um, transform our understanding of form. Sylvia Levin at UCLA, who advanced that computational uh, agenda to include affect and effect. Um, and Bob Somel now at UIC again, uh, just to come full circle, where the imprint of shape as program generator is, uh, is uh, having a definite mark on the school. One can point to two camps in our field, loosely, um, the, the formal and the programmatic. Um, and here, I just do, to identify them, I use two figures who aren't here at the conference and probably should be, um, Peter Eisenman and Bob Sommel. These two poles, like the Bauhaus bullseye or the IIT matrix, offer a helpful framework for situating the future which I would argue actually has to intersect the two. Um, the, the splitting of form and program into these singular camps as if they can exist on their own. Um, the the um, repeated uh, utterance that we hear of, of people saying, well, that's simply a, a school that's interested in form uh, as, as if that a, a school could not be um, taking on issues of program or vice versa, that a school wants to engage only program or an architect designer wants to engage only program without um, having an interest in form. Seems to me a, um, one of the most ridiculous um, divides. Uh, that, so it's an artificial divide as if you could, you could isolate um, one or the other. Returning to the point of legibility, uh, I would say that legibility offers a clarity for both uh, formal and organizational or programmatic reception. Um, and here I would, I would use, actually this is the, the one slide I'll show of our own work from WW. This is a house that we're doing in Princeton. And here you can see our interest in the non-representational figure, um, a, the yellow and black form that is uh, uh, something that actually works both as a formal device and a programmatic device for creating relationships within the domestic interior. But our interest in the, the figure or the question of legibility has built into it a, a necessary oscillation between these two poles of, of architecture, between the formal and the programmatic. It's itself a composite that includes form and organization, but of course also materiality, technology, among other qualities that are inherent to architecture. So I'd say that the future is looking up. It's this very legibility that offers a bias or a direction or a point that offers, it manages to avoid the pitfall of proliferation and that engages an audience or a public and a politics, and I would say ideally with a bit of humor. Um, and that's not necessary, it's not just necessary for the future, it's something that we need, I would say, right now. Thank you. <laughs>